I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land from which we are all tuning in. And many of you may be coming from various places along the Connecticut River. Uh, for my home in what is Conway, Massachusetts, I'd like to acknowledge that I stand on Nipmuc land. And I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohican and Pequot to the south, the Mohican and Mohawk to the west, and the Abenaki and Penacooks to the north. Um, I'm Polly Byers. I'm executive director of the Karuna Center for Peacebuilding, which is an NGO based in Amherst, Massachusetts. And for those of you who may not know, Karuna started a little over 25 years ago, focused on bridging divides in countries affected by violence and has worked in over 40 countries by this point, um, using a variety of different approaches to support dialogue, foster reconciliation, and build inclusive governance. And in addition to the international work that Karuna is known for mostly, it's also been involved in promoting dialogue and understanding on key issues in the US. And most recently, we sponsored a talk on a series called Understanding the Many Dimensions of White Power. Um, and today's talk by Larry is the second of the current series, which is called Erasure and Restoration, which is a lecture, workshop, and dialogue series that explores both historical and current narratives around local indigenous presence, as well as the ongoing settler mindset that has contribute, contributed to the threat and myth of erasure. The series is guided by an advisory committee of indigenous people and non-indigenous allies. And we hope that this event, similar to the last one that some of you may have also attended, will provide an opportunity to understand the native narratives of an area many of us call home. And with 2020 being the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's landing in 1620, it seems a particularly opportune moment to examine the way history has often been told by settlers' descendants, often excluding the voices of indigenous people, downplaying the systemic violence and attempted erasure of indigenous communities. The goal of the series is to explore these questions, examining who are the narrators of indigenous history and to develop a deeper, more nuanced understanding of the history of this area. And it also raises many questions about who gets to shape our understanding of history and why, and highlights the fact that history is an ongoing collective process in which we are all engaged. And finally, I just wanna thank our supporters, Mass Humanities, Mass Cultural Council, and the Ellis L. Phillips Foundation, without whom we've not been able to do this. And also to Christina Downing, who is so masterfully from Karuna staff uh, pulled this all together. So now turning to a brief introduction of Larry Spotted Crow Man. He is a nationally acclaimed author, citizen of the Nipmuc tribe of Massachusetts. He's an award-winning writer, poet, cultural educational educator, traditional storyteller, tribal drummer, dancer, and motivational speaker involving youth sobriety, cultural and environmental awareness, and cultural and environmental awareness. Larry is a council member of the Okateo Cultural Center and has also served on a, as a board member of the Nipmuc Cultural Preservation Group, which is an organization set up to promote the cultural, social, and spiritual needs of Nipmuc people, as well as serving as an educational resource of Native American studies. He also serves as a review committee member with the Native American Poets Project at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. Larry travels throughout the US, Canada, and Europe to schools, colleges, powwows, and other organizations sharing the music, culture, and history of the Nipmuc people. He's given lectures at universities throughout New England on issues ranging from Native American sovereignty to identity. We are thrilled to have him with us today. And just a quick reminder, the questions can be asked through the chat window or by the chat, the function of raising a hand. Um, I would like to say raising your hand, your real hand, but I think there are so many people that would be very hard to um, follow. And you can begin entering questions into the chat um, during any time during the talk. So with that, it is over to Larry. Thank you, Kutubadamish. Mm -hmm. um, I am so grateful to be with all of you here today. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge and take a moment that we all just kind of breathe in this moment that we're going to share together. Um, it's truly uh, an honor to uh, come into your cyber world in this way, uh, which is very, um, it's uh, quite a transition from uh, what I'm used to, uh, but uh, quickly adjusting uh, as that Crow Medicine teaches us uh, to do. Um, so I'm really uh, pleased that I uh, see about 100 people already in here. Um, 
So I'm uh, really grateful uh, that you would be here with me today. I wanna thank the Karuna Center for uh, hosting these events. Uh, this is very significant and important to the indigenous people of the area. Uh, and most of all, I want to um, open up in our, in our way as I speak to you from my traditional homeland here in uh, Nipmunk country, uh, central Massachusetts. This is the home of my ancestors where we have lived for thousands of years. Uh, this is where we fished, hunted, raised our families here, built our homes here, shared in intellectual uh, uh, pursuits in, in, in all different manners of society that we have uh, in, um, uh, endured for, for thousands of years that we've shared with one another. So it's important to not only honor them, but also honor them in, in the way that I was taught. And that is in our Algonquin language, because that is the language of uh, the land that uh, I'm on now, the trees, remember that language, the river, the nippy, the water, the mountains that uh, is in front of me, I'm facing the north now, uh, Wachusett, that mountain. And behind me is uh, the land of Wabakwasit, my uh, ancestors as well. And so we say in our language, Woon Nashayanatumu Manitou, Tabatni, Takushi Kidnison, Okumis, Tabatni Wuchi Sapausu, Usukati Huna, Notas Niniwa Menantion, King Nuta Yu Pentamino, and a male Niniwa Mekwantam Kichia, Ka Mata Wananta, Ka Nagwiti Kokuta Niniwa, Manitou, Usukati Huna. I greet you all in the words of my ancestors in the Nipmunk language. And there is no exact translation because as my late cousin uh, Tall Pine would say, the language is the ecology of the land. And the best way to try to translate that is that I was talking about inviting my ancestors, but also your ancestors into, ancestors into this conversation that we would share in a good way that interrelationship and that reciprocity that we, uh, we should be having as beings, not just to the two-legged, but to the trees and the, and the land and the stones and all the different things around us, that we really understand that we're having this constant happening of a relationship all the time around us. And sometimes we don't know why we feel a certain way or why we not feel in the way we think we should. And we're forgetting that relationship with all the other living beings because they're, they're participating in that. And, um, not to go off that topic too much, but when we think about uh, our environment, all the pollutants. Hey, Larry, you accidentally just went on. on... Yeah, you just muted. We can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, you're back. Oh, I wonder how that happened. I didn't mean anything. <laughs> um, I don't know how much you missed, but uh, what did I leave off? What did you hear? Just a little bit, just like the last sentence. So. Okay, so I was uh, talking about how uh, even in our environment, we need to really be conscious of about the things that are around us. Um, and that's that's for another talk, uh, but it's all it all inter it all interrelates to uh, who we are as beings. So um, once again, Nina Hokan Kantu Chokasiche, that is my name and uh, and my traditional language, uh, Larry Spotted Crow, and uh, I am from the Nipmuc uh, people, the Nipmuc Nation here in Massachusetts. Um, yes, I'm a culture educator, a teacher, writer, and um, I've been sharing these things uh, for about 30 years now. And um, I just want to show a little something, a little screen share for a moment. I should be doing it. You guys seeing that? No, not yet. No, not yet. Okay, let's try that again. Okay. Yes? Nope. Huh. Wait, how about now? Yes. All right. Yes. Right there. You did it. <laughs> Yay. So I just wanted to, for those who don't know me and haven't seen my name or around or and things like that, just wanted to share this uh, image here. Some of the places I have shared uh, uh, my storytelling and, and tradition around uh, different places. Uh, the picture in the top left is, is me and uh, when I was in Nook, Greenland, one of the most rewarding and enriching times of my life uh, when I spent there uh, some time there with the Inuit people in Greenland. Uh, and uh, in the middle, that's a local library. And uh, up to the far right corner, that's uh, me at the uh, wonderful uh, community I share with the uh, Forest County Potawatomi uh, community in uh, Wisconsin. And below uh, are pictures of um, another uh, event. I forget where that one was, um, doing some storytelling. And to the left there, it's one of my uh, um, little cousins, our tribal members, and we were doing some drum making class there. Um, and so, and so the topic of this talk, the reason why I share that is, is that um, we talk about uh, we are story, we are the land, we are the land. And that has a very deep significance to 
Native people and really anybody in general when you think about uh, in terms of uh, how they're sharing that story. And so and with that story, it's always accompanied by our tradition, our music, because the music is that rhythm, that reverberation. So right now, before we go any further, I think it's important. I want to share um, it's a Nipmuc, what we call a paddle song, because uh, the rivers, as uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, Connecticut are very significant to all our people here in the East as well. For the Nipmuc people, the Blackstone River, the Quaybog, the French River that used to be called the Menexit, Merrimack River, uh, and, and many others. So we would share songs such as this on that river. So the words, the words in that song are, uh, as I said, it's a paddle song. So what we're saying in that song is, water is life, water lives for us. That's the rough translation I can give you, uh, the term that we are familiar with today, water is life. And that is saying in the, in the Nipmuc language, we live for the water, the water lives for us. And uh, the second part is saying, paddle strong, people, paddle strong. And that is a song we would share. And now I want to um, kind of see this with the virtual screen. This uh, tribal drum. And one of the things I like to tell people when we talk about we are story, we are the land, is when we, when we hear this beat, it reminds us of something very personal to us. Something that's behind me right now in my image, the heart. And so when we think about all the different strife and different issues that we have as people, uh, whether it's gender or race or ethnicity, and we're having all these hard times. And uh, the way my grandfather and ancestors taught me about that is that we have to remember on the inside, everybody, every living thing is doing this. So when we look at a person and see the heartbeat, it will dramatically change our perception. When we begin to understand they are just like us, they have a heartbeat. And they are part of this circle, like every living thing. So I would share this Nippon healing song because right now I understand that, our, including my community, there's been a lot of hardship this year. Uh, 2020 is almost like a pejorative now, saying that word. Uh, so I want to share this Nippon healing song with everybody and um, kind of help, help out. <laughs> Yeah, you 
baño que yo agua ni en el agua ni la guanti anda ni la guanti anda ay 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 Sabatini. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, it's a real, real good. It's a real good feeling to um to sing because when I'm singing, um uh it's in the moment. It's uh it's not about trying to get to the end. It's uh the beauty of the music or the beauty of the art is not the completion, it's the process. And we always think about that um uh when we when we're sharing our music because it, it connects you back to that reverberation. So there's a lot going on, but there's nothing going on at the same time, if that makes sense. And it's a beautiful thing to kind of get centered and grounded when you're singing. Um, just before the pandemic, um, I was uh, touring down in uh, Ecuador and it was just uh, an absolute amazing time. And I spoke at the University of Cuenca up in the high Andes. And um, I also got in, in a copious amount of surfing. Uh, yes, uh, my latest uh, uh, love of life is surfing and I really, uh, shout out to my Polynesian brothers and sisters for sharing that medicine with us because it's a truly a, a beautiful thing in my 50s to be out there uh, catching those waves and um, it's a really it's a very spiritual process and I know some think it's a really like a kind of this hipster uh, kind of crazy uh, hippie kind of a thing but it's really much deeper process than that and I would encourage everybody to look into it uh, so that's just kind of another thing that's been appropriate and kind of you know, uh, misuse in the sense if you look at it that way as well. So in Ecuador, I, um, I, uh, it, it was a really a wonderful experience, as I said, when I, I got to share with some of the indigenous people from, uh, from the Andes there, from the regions of the Amazon. And, and uh, I just get goosebumps thinking about it because there was this medicine man, elder, who had, he works at the university from time to time. He comes out of the, of the Amazon to share and he heard I was coming from the States and he came down just to be there for me and he gifted me with a conch shell that I have over there and uh, he didn't speak English but he spoke his uh, Spanish and his tribal language and um, I was just absolutely blown away by the by the level of uh, knowledge and in, in, in science scientific knowledge and in, in intellectual uh, uh, amazement that he shared uh, uh, based on his traditions and culture the way he was like really uh, articulating that, I was blown away. Uh, it, you know, I can imagine it hearing it in the first language, but getting it uh, translated into English was still uh, very um, powerful. Uh, and so, you know, that really reminds me. That kind of brings me back to circles back to when I when I say this talk is about we are the story, we are the land. And so these stories that the indigenous people have from around the world are they are the center. They are the the heartbeat, right? They are that standard of understanding and, and to codify yourself excuse me water uh and codify yourself to the land itself um i grew up in western mass uh in the 80s and um when i went to school there was absolutely zero curriculum for native people uh even more so it was probably one of the worst times of my life growing up as a native child in, in massachusetts uh, we were picked on, me and my siblings, not just by other kids, but teachers as well. Uh, I was told, uh, your tribe is extinct. Uh, everything I heard in class about all the heroes and, and people who were celebrated uh, uh, were never Native American. Uh, I came to believe that um, I, me and my family were simply hapless bystanders benefiting from white proximity. Um, and so I had no role models. and. Um, uh, and it and it caused me to um, really dip into a lot of destructive behavior, uh, and, it, and it nearly killed me. Uh, alcohol and, and just kind of giving up, and um, and and I was really blessed, I think, to uh, to be where I am. And it was, this was like thought out, I think, in the in the stars somewhere, uh, long before I was even here to go through certain processes and understanding. Um, because by the time I was 21, I was near death from drinking so much, and um, and I always shared the story because it was the <laughs> it was the day my life turned around. Uh, being in the hospital, uh, you know, because you know the drinking started heavy by the time I was 16, and 
you know, drinking all the time. And the only really happy time is going back to be with my community in the, in the country with my grandpa and eating Bannock and Succotash and, and doing the things that the city kids didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So it was really just an odd situation to be in and coming back with my sneakers all muddy. And, you know, when you're in the city, that's a big no-no. And so we, um, we grew up hard, you know, my oldest brother was called um, uh, Injun Joe. And, and so we, we dealt with all this and the way I dealt with that was through alcohol. And so, um, and in depression. And so by the time I was 21, I was near death and in the hospital with alcohol poisoning. And um, the TV was on and, um, and I was always a smart guy. I loved poetry and I was very inquisitive and I wanted to be an astronomer and I loved science, but of course, alcohol was impeding all that, right? And you know, and the teachers sucked at the time and they weren't really there for me. And you know, and, I, and, and just a shout out to the colleges because everything's changed when I went to college. And, I was really glad I got a new perspective on the, the educational system. And that's, that's still a work in process, mind you. But uh, so I was there and um, just really messed up, you know, in a bad space. And, um, and I looked and the TV monitor was on as they have these in the, in the rooms and I'm, and I'm watching this. And of all things that were on, it was a PBS documentary about Christopher Columbus of all people. And it really caught my attention and I, and I started listening. Then um, the narrator got to the part where he started talking about how the Europeans brought alcohol to the Native Americans and summarily destroyed their community from every facet you can think of. Their, their, their language, their land was being usurped. Uh, they were just absolutely destroying them from within and without using alcohol. It was weaponized against them. And as I watched that, um, it was a feeling that I still can't explain to this day. Something came over me. I wanted to cry. I wanted to laugh. I wanted to scream. I just got this chill to my core. Uh, and I never really thought about it in the way that I was visualizing this for the first time about alcohol. And um, I left that hospital. I survived. And uh, I never drank again after that day. And that was 30 years ago this year. And, um, and since that day, when I left that hospital, I came out, once I kind of got myself together, I, I was scratching my head like in this kind of post-apocalyptic fog of trying to understand why was I abused and, and mistreated on the very land of my ancestors? Um, why are we be being treated like we don't belong here? Why is the history of who we are uh, denied? Um, and so my first journey was to my grandfather and that's when I was gifted Kankanto Chokeseche, guys, as, uh, as uh, we as Native people in life, our names and, and uh, change during time. And my grandfather told me, who's passed many years now, and uh, very grateful, I had many years to share with him. He, uh, he told me, um, uh, when he gifted me the name, he explained a lot of things that I'd really rather not share here. It was personal, but uh, over, he was telling me the crow uh, is going to take you many places and you're going to be the storyteller. And you're going to go many places. And he gave me a, uh, a drum. I don't, it's not this one, but he gave me my first drum. And I still have it in the other room. And he told me, you're going to sing and you're going to travel the world. And, and I was like, dude, I've been drunk and hanging out and partying. I'm not, you know, what are you talking about? You know? And, uh, and little did I know, as the more I started diving into who I was and listening to my grandpa, I went to the other elders in the, in the community and, uh, and I remember as a kid, my mom trying to get me to go to powwow. I, I didn't want to go because I just felt like uh, being native was more of a mystery to me or just as much of a mystery to me as it was to the non-native people because it was looked at as such a pejorative and something not to be. It was, I was afraid, but I couldn't get away from it because people knew who we were and those are the Indians over there and, and they don't really belong here <laughs> is essentially what we were treated like. And so um, I just went on this journey of just, in the same vigor I had to drink, that was the was equal, if not more vigor, I had to learn and study and just kind of absorb absolutely everything I could about indigenous epistemology in every form, shape, and guise. Um, and in this last 30 years, I've traveled the world, I've written books, I've shared the drama across the country, uh, and it, it's just been an absolutely amazing experience. And um, probably some of the most significant work I've done is able to give back in terms of helping other Native youth uh, understand. Uh, and, and share my story of survival. And, and, uh, and what I learned during this process is that story. We are all telling ourselves a story. And when I was a kid, I was telling my story. I am nobody. 
because the society was telling me that story. I had nothing to mirror myself on. And so when indigenous people tell themselves they don't have a story because uh, the skies became Greek, the land and, and water became English, and all these stories that we were taught about crow and bear and, and the toad woman and the stones and the trees were supplanted by this ideology of white supremacy. And so what do we have to look to when we can't see our story in the trees or, or the water, all these things that were taken away from us? So I've been spending my life putting it back because I, am, uh, I stand on the shoulder of, of giants, as we say. And I know um, uh, the reason I was sa saved, it was to do this work. And uh, it's, it's been as much as passion as it was the first day as it is today. And every day, uh, every time I speak in front of people, I have the same goosebumps because I know I have a chance to talk about, I say the word nitma, a word that was not supposed to be alive. I have a chance to say uh, some of the Vickers relatives that I come from who were put in boarding schools for two generations. I have a chance to share how the Native American people are the highest enlisted people in the military, but they don't get credit for it. Per ratio of, of uh, ethnic background, indigenous people are the most to share. I have an opportunity to share that I'm a, as they call it, a son of the Revolutionary War. Two of my great, great, great grandfathers served and defended this country and this civil war. I had the following grandpas who were part of that. And so after giving so much to this country and then realizing we were also having our kids taking away and our land usurped at the same time, it's a hard pill to swallow and understand about what is going on here. Um, and so, and it's about that story that was robbed away. And, um, and it's, it was not by accident. And so I wanna share a slide here. Uh, bear with me. Here. Is that sharing? We see that? Yes, yes. We see it. Yes, we do. Oh, thank you. Thanks, folks. Um, so I have this uh, slide up here because I want people to take a good look at it. On the top, it has a quote from the Aboriginal leader, George Erasmus. Uh, and he says that uh, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must be shared. So we have a story of America that's being told, but it's not shared by everyone. We have a story of discovered lands, God's chosen people, exceptionalism, freedom, opportunity, promised lands, manifest de destiny, and land of endless resources. While millions of others, uh, African Americans, Native Americans, and other people of color have a shared and lived experience of genocide, stolen lands, enslavement, forced removals, mascots, cultural appropriation, boarding schools, Jim Crow logs, children separated at our border, and on and on and on it goes. So the divide here of the story that we're telling uh, ourselves about this country is as far away as a hawk from the moon. Um, and so this is the problem um, when we think about the stories that we're telling ourselves. Um, there are many indigenous people who've gone to the grave who've never got a chance to realize the lies that they've been taught that they're nobody. Um, information is power. And because of the things I know, I'm prepared and equipped to share and articulate um, the truth and tell about all these lies that we've been taught. The lies about exceptionalism and white supremacy and the lies how indigenous people didn't contribute anything. Uh, and that's been problematic for, for our existence. And, but it's been, that was the purpose to kind of, um, it's, it's about oppression, right? And, and so I've spent my life kind of empowering and, and sharing that. And, um, and some of the things I talk about, I, I, um, we've done work with um, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health on, uh, for, for middle school children to, um, to deal with the crisis of suicide and, and, and um, addiction. Um, between 2014 and 2016, right here in my state of Massachusetts, those two years, we lost 24 indigenous youth to suicide or overdose. That's one kid a month dying for two years straight from an addiction. We can do better. And it's because of that story, that lie, that the system has taught them that they didn't have the outlet they didn't have the opportunity, much like when I was a kid, 
uh, they didn't have a chance to, to share and, and uh, self-actualize who they really are as a human being. Um, and so it's about teaching people to want to do better. Um, one of the things I talk to when I share with youth, and I'm going to get to my book, Drumming and Dreaming, in a second. But one of the things I uh, try to relate, when I, especially when I speak to young, young Native kids, is that um, I tell them, let's go outside and um, explore a little bit. Sometimes, you know, we'll see a squirrel, look over there, flowers, there's, there's a bee over there doing something, getting some pollen, right? Bees doing, doing their job, providing us 80% of the food, pollinating that, right? Awesome bees, go bees. Then on the ground, you look down, you probably see a worm digging a hole. And I say to the youth, I say, what do you think about those, those creatures? I said, let's, let's, like, let's kind of like talk about the squirrel right now. So there's that squirrel. He's collecting nuts and he's building a lodge, you know, and um, he's, he's actually helping the environment by, by doing the different things that he does. Okay, and then we, then we go over here and look at that bumblebee, how they're pollinating the plants and providing us with all this food, you know, and, and doing all the wonderful things that they do to help us survive. Then that little slithery thing on the ground, that worm is going down there. He's actually providing oxygen to the soil by digging those holes. And all, then the other animals will come around and feed on him. So it's a, he's, he has a very important role. And I said, wow, these tiny things, you got the little squirrel and the little tiny bee, they are pretty important, aren't they? I said, now imagine how important you must be. Those little creatures are so important to the great spirit. Just think for a minute then how important you are. And that's the story we don't get to hear. Larry you just went on mute, mute again. It's a plot, I tell you. <laughs> it might be. It won't be the first time. Um, and so that is the story we're telling our, our, our youth that we need to relate back to the land. All right, I'm going to jump. It's um, still early yet. You guys all right? Everybody good? I'm good. This is this is real good stuff here. And so, um, and by the way, if you want to, if you're interested in um, any of my books, go to whisperingbasket.com. Uh, you can see all my work there. And also the uh, Oki Tale. Uh, and if I get a chance to mention that, it's a beautiful cultural center uh, that we just got up and running uh, in uh, Western Mass uh, through the help of uh, Double Edge Theater. And uh, I know I was introduced as a council, but council member, but I've been promoted to director, so uh, I, I must add that. <laughs> uh, so it's a real good feeling to be a part of that. And uh, uh, we have uh, Jess Cree, uh, Dr. Jess Cree, teaching, uh, is gonna share on indigenous medicine this week, and uh, we've held a few panels. So we really encourage uh, folks out there, um, uh, if you wanna help out uh, indigenous work, uh, please support Okiteo and other uh, indigenous people in your area, wherever you may be. Get to know uh, your, your tribe, your community, and uh, support them. Support local, I always say, or support abroad as well. Because uh, as a writer, I, I, um, it's always important for me to say that um, if you purchase one of my books, you will help me go back to college. But if you purchase two of my books, I don't have to go back to college. You decide. Yes, he has jokes. He does. So. Uh, my latest book, Drumming and Dreaming, is a collection of, uh, uh, I've been reading from this book to kind of um, uh, ground us in, uh, in, in what we, when we talk about story. And so I'm going to read the story of uh, three sisters and really kind of tell you what that means and how it really uh, dramatically changes our perspective of not only the land, but on the people who are sharing that story. But before I get to that, I'm going to take a sip of water and I want to I want to read the forward of uh, Drumming and Dreaming. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Okay. You didn't have to really say it. I was just kind of, it was like a, you know, rhetorical nod. <laughs> um, so yes, Drumming and Dreaming was my latest book. And um, so I want, I think it's, a, it's important that I share the forward uh, of this book. In April of 2015, I was fortunate enough to have been invited to be a guest speaker at Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas. It was for their sixth annual Indigenous Empowerment Summit. It was an amazing week of inspirational stories, cultural resources, music, powwow, 
and traditional cuisine. A special thanks to Julia Whitebow for making it possible for me to be there. And by the way, she probably gets annoyed when people say this, but Julia Whitebow is the granddaughter of the one and only Russell Means. So thanks, Julia. I was, thr I was thrilled to hear and bear witness to hundreds of young natives achieving academic greatness while maintaining strong ties to their culture. The most honored moment was when I was asked to do the opening prayer and song for sunrise ceremony. The ceremony is conducted at the Sacred Medicine Wheel. This revered area of high school campus is where hundreds of Native children lost their lives due to abuse, neglect, and suicide during the boarding school era. Most of those graves are still unmarked. It was 5 a.m. when student and committee leader of the Empowerment Summit, Chris Sandone, came to pick me up at the hotel. As we traversed the early roads of Lawrence, Kansas, Chris began giving me the layout for the morning events. I listened in earnest. Preparing for ceremony is always a serious matter. But what I've learned in most Native communities, including my own, a bit of levity is always the first dose of medicine. This led to our subsequent discussion of whether fry bread tastes better than bannock. Now there's a lot of tribal pride throughout the United States and Canada concerning these two breads. So we are both meticulous in laying out our case for our own personal preference, which I won't mention here because Chris is currently the student Senate president of Haskell. His impartiality on such matters is crucial. In addition, Mr. Sendone being a New York Yankees fan and I being a Boston Red Sox fan led to further complications. We decided to drop the matter altogether. When we arrived at the sacred medicine wheel, the morning dew kissed the air and the night had not yet surrendered its chill. I walked with Chris to gather wood for the ceremonial fire. Many other students and Haskell staff soon joined for ceremony. It was an honor to be there with those future tribal leaders and faculty working so hard to make a difference. We formed a circle, took a moment, and prayed in silence. When the first flame, that first sacred flame came forth, it reminded me of a new birth. The crackling embers and bird off in the distance singing, singing a beautiful song was the first to speak. Father's son slowly peeked, and the trees that edged the horizon glinted a silhouette emblazoned with splendid orange glow. The wetlands that bordered the medicine well were patched with tall brindled reeds that danced in the gentle wind. This was one of the most peaceful, lovely, and serene moments I can ever imagine. Yet I was standing in a place where countless tears have fallen, cries for help ignored, and the right to exist as a Native American were denied. The beauty and blessings of a new day were all around, and it merged in my heart with the great tragedy that befell this, all those innocent children. I took out my drum, drum and began singing the Nipmuc healing song. The words are all in my Algonquin language, as I shared earlier. It brought to mind how language and story were forbidden to these young souls. And more than anything else, I wanted my prayers to convey a message of survival and resistance. This is the same survival and resistance that I am also a product of. Our elders tell us that we are the answer to someone's prayer and someone's dream. So what you're about to read are indigenous tales that never made it to the, to the ears and hearts of countless children that it was meant for. So may these stories flow on the lips of the wind and eternally whisper in the hearts of every little soul. This is your book. These are your stories. It was um, one of the most memorable experiences that I had there. And, um, and as I reflect on that, it, it, it went into even, to, um, even more intensity, which I didn't put in the book. Um, but um, when I when I wrote drumming and dreaming, uh, it was a uh, painstaking work to uh, get the stories not only right but um, also get the stories uh, in the way that our ancestors would would uh, would want them. And one of the things I'm reminded of, and I'll just share this this other message here before I get into that story, something our ancestors would teach us: as long as we 
the descendants of the first people of North America are here. The stories never die. They live in us and through us. If ever they become dormant, we have the power to revive them in that ancient voice in which our ancestors speak. And through our ancestors' voice comes the authority and authenticity to allow the story to continue to be told. Um, and so when we hear these stories, our, our legends, our tales, our stories, we are connected back to place. Um, something that when we, as I said, when we look up at the sky and we're told these are Greek constellations and it, it's not the sky bear in, in, the, in the different uh, constellations that we were taught for thousands of years on this land, the cosmology, the horticulture, the different things we're, we're taking away, then we, we are lost and empty. And to fill that, we find these harmful substances. So these stories about are about reclaiming that identity. These stories are about intellectual uh, uh, knowledge, because um, what people are now understanding, and you're gonna and you're gonna get a taste of that when I read the, the three sisters stories. How intricate and how scientific these stories are, and the wisdom and the creativity that our ancestors went through to not only share these stories, but in such a creative and entertaining way that you are in such harmonic resonance with the planet and everything around you that you're not only doing it because you want to, but you're having fun doing it while you're doing it because you realize that that is a part of you and you are a part of it. And so I thought the best story to share for that, and they're all good. Um, I have my favorites, of course. Usually there's a crow in it. Ah! Yeah, you guys are lucky I'm sitting down because I'd be all over the place. I just, and the book helps me, <laughs> helps me stay to my chair. Right? I, um, I usually share stories without um, reading. I, I share them. But uh, the, the, holding the book helps me sit down. So it's all good. So I'm going to share the story of the three sisters. Oh, what page is that on? Larry, it's your book. You should know the page, but I don't. Okay. Ah, the three sisters. Before I read the story, I want to acknowledge as well, uh, the story of three sisters is very prevalent in our Eastern Woodland people and uh, other tribal nations throughout the continent. Um, so it's a very important story. It's told many different ways. Uh, and so this is the way that uh, our Nippon people share it. So the three sisters. Long ago, it was this way. There were three sisters, each one very beautiful. But the young girls were very different from each other as well. One was very tall, slender, had long, yellow, smooth hair. The other sister was a little shorter. She had long, curly, and shiny brown hair. The third sister was shorter than the other two. Her hair was radiant black, wavy, but was also very long. These sisters loved each other very much, however. But even though they loved each other dearly, these differences brought about arguments and strife among them all the time. The endless bickering led to them not spending much time together at all. So each sister began to keep to themselves unless it was a disagreement with one another. Their mother, uh, witnessing all this, she was very upset. She urged them to get along and share with one another. The girls refused. So their mother thought for a long time, what am I to do? A few days had passed. The three sisters were out in the garden they were at it again. And they were arguing amongst themselves, you know, as, as they always had been. And they were going at it pretty good, shouting, pointing their finger and shaking their finger in the air and just kind of really getting into it. And their mother asked them, stop this bickering at once, she cried. She asked the three sisters and she called them all together. She says, okay, sit down beside me. But the girls were very stubborn. Just as one sister would sit down, the other girl would get up and leave. Then when the other would come and sit down, the other one would walk away. Back and forth they went, not wanting to sit together, not wanting to be as one. Mother grew very tired of this. Finally, she came up with an idea and she said, I want all of you to sit, come to the garden, sit, sit in the garden. Mother said, I want you girls to listen. You three sisters are all very special and unique, but you're also part of me. Each one of you. You need to share not only the beauty of yourself, but
but the beauty of each other. Remember that. Girls frowned, mumbled, cut their eyes at each other. And as they fidgeted about, the mother said, I want you to sit here until you make peace. Sit here until you resolve your differences. Then the mother took each girl's hair and held it gently in her hands. She brought all the girl's hair together. The yellow, brown, black hair was twisted into a long, beautiful braid. She told them, stay here until you have resolved this quarrel. Once you have come to an accord, unloose the braid. When I see you have unloosened the braid, I will know you have made peace. The girls sat for a very long time. The mother returned often to check on them, and she noticed the braid had not been undone. And as the girls sat in the garden, the long braid began to grow, and it began to take root right into the ground. And then when the mother returned this time, corn, beans, and squash grew in the spot where the daughter sat. The mother was very sad and she cried. But then the plant spoke to the mother and said, do not despair mother, we have, to come, we have come together in the way that honors our differences as you had asked us to do. And we will always be with you mother. And what we have learned, we will share with many generations to come. We shall teach that even with great differences among us, we can come together and share with each other. And when we share with one another, a new strength is born. Sister Corn provided a structure for Sister Beans to climb, eliminating the need for poles. Sister Beans provided nutrients to Mother Earth that helped her sisters grow healthy and strong. The Sister Squash spread all around the ground, blocking the sunlight to prevent the weeds from growing on her sisters. The Sister Squash grew leaves and wide leaves to keep moisture in the soil and grew prickly hairs on the vine to deter pests. The three sisters teach us that by sharing with one another, we not only can heal from within, but also become stronger in unity. Botany. That story does so many things and I would probably forget some of them. Um, so many amazing things that that story does. Let's start with, um, with, uh, with the polyculture. Um, and, and so I'm going to take you a little bit down a scientific road, a traditional road, and a, and a social road as well. And so these stories are able to do all those things and, and more, in, as well as the metaphysical uh, connection that we have. And this is the power I'm, I'm illustrating to you that these stories do. So when we talk about polyculture, we're talking about growing plants together uh, to, 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 to get a better outcome. And this is something that uh, European and Western society did not do. They do what we call a monoculture. So you'll see large swaths of fields of one vegetable growing. And what happens when you do that, you get pests and you get uh, blight and you get all these different problems because you have one species growing. And so the idea of the polyculture is growing different things together. It was an, uh, an agricultural marvel that uh, Western science is now beginning to understand. It was ingenious for its time and still is today. And so this is something that we're not taught in school. They don't teach us that. And as, a, as an aside, uh, if we think about what made America and, and Canada as well successful, if, we, if I ask a, a high school class or a college class, what, what was the trigger for that? They'll say, well, the Industrial Revolution. Okay, well, how did that happen? What was the main ingredients for that? Uh, steel, rubber, and what's the other one? Petroleum, right? So rubber and petroleum, that was first discovered by indigenous people. We don't teach that, right? So I just need to add that in there because these are things that people need to go and, yeah, look, look that up and you'll see. It's good stuff. And so these are the things, and by the way, sneakers too. Native people did that. Thank you, Michael Jordan. Uh, so polyculture versus monoculture. And this is a way that, an ingenious way that indigenous people engage with their environment in a holistic way. Um, number two, women. Um, so, and I have to say, there's a lot of talk about women's rights now, but this started with indigenous people. The Europeans marveled at the rights that women had. And so in the story, you see the empowerment of women and how they're providing, uh, and that also they're demonstrating that relationship, that feminine aspect of mother earth. And the women are the empowerers here. They're the feeders, they're the providers. And they're, they're able to save a generation, save countless people, right? By this understanding. 
Um, and so, and so this, is, uh, this is something that's not talked about as well. Uh, the suffrage movement, when that, when that was founded, they were inspired by many of the Haudenosaunee women. And they, they write about that. I don't know if they give them all credit by name, but they mentioned that they, uh, it was the Haudenosaunee, their freedom and their, their love of their zeal for this understanding and the way their relationship was that they wanted to model after that. So we were already doing these things. Um, so the freedoms that we talk about now, the indigenous people are already engaged in. Um, and then uh, there was another important one I wanted to bring up, um, just kind of slip in my mind now. But, uh, and so when we think about polyculture, ah, uh, yes, of course, the, the food itself, complex carbohydrates, amino acids, uh, you could live off corn beans and squash. And then the meal, the meat is just a bonus. So again, you know, we're talking about very intelligent thinking here. A lot of, a lot of thought went into doing what we're doing here. Um, so it's just really amazing thing. Uh, corn beans and squash, the complex carbohydrates, amino acids, and so that's like a, a whole meal that you're you're able to to engage in. And so um, the stories. So if you're a native person and you're hearing the story of the three sisters, or how Crow bought the corn, or um, how the creation story was formed, or how the story of Sky Bear, when you look up at what they now call the Big Dipper and you see Sky Bear, all around you are reminders that you are home. All around you are reminders that, yeah, we, we contributed quite a bit, didn't we? But those reminders were taken away. And what was put in its place? Uh, George Washington and, and Independence Day and all these other things that Native people are, were, uh, in contrast, were being uh, assimilated and put in boarding schools and essentially being destroyed during all that. Um, I don't want to get into numbers here about the, the Native population because it's always tricky. And uh, I don't think we really know. Uh, we know there were millions and millions and millions of people here. Um, uh, a rough estimate, we wanted to just say there was like 20 million Native people here. Uh, during contact, there was a 96% 96, 96 rate of genocide of Indigenous people. So even if you want to take that low number of 20 million, uh, in the late 1900s, there was less than a quarter of a, quarter of a, a million Native people. Uh, and so, again, that number gives you this, this ratio of, of a genocide rate that is incomparable anywhere in history, anywhere in, on earth uh, at that, through history, at that genocide rate is not comparable to anywhere. Um, and so, and during the early, the, the early 1900s and, and, and uh, to the present, that's when most of our states, uh, 32 states, I believe, I don't have the records in front of me, joined the union. And while the, America was expanding, Indians were disappear, disappearing onto reservations, uh, dying at a disproportionate way from health disparities, from alcohol disease, the, the big three we call them, alcohol, depression, and diabetes that indigenous people disproportionately suffer from, dying at that from preventable diseases as well. And so all this history that is not talked about, uh, again, what story are we telling each other? Uh, there's never been a public apology to indigenous people from this country. Uh, during the Obama administration on I think the 30th or 40th page of the Department of Defense paper, there was a little nice note about saying, uh, uh, we're sorry about uh, taking the land of the indigenous people and we know we did some wrong things, but let's all get along now. And at the end of that was a disclaimer saying that by this, we don't, this does not acknowledge that we uh, open ourselves up to any kind of lawsuits or land claims. <laughs> so that was neat, right? Uh, so it's like, we're sorry, but then they like yank it back. You know, those like bullies on the, on the playground where they hold that lollipop in front of a little kid and they pull it away. That's kind of like what America's doing when they do something like that. Um, there's never been a truth, truth and reconciliation of, of what happens. And some of our indigenous scholars rightly talk about when we use the term reconcile, it means that there was a once, there was a one-time harmony. And so there was never that one-time harmony. Um, going backwards from the time the Mayflower landed, there's really no good time for, for indigenous people in terms of what we had to experience. Um, and so when I talk to like uh, college students and different people, uh, uh, when I share, and, uh, and sometimes I'm in awe, just thinking about, um, uh, and I'm gonna go to questions pretty soon as well too, um, as I see the time. Um, and, and I'm in awe, and I'll, after this, I'll, I'll go to questions because I did kind of share quite a bit. Um, when I just kind of reflect on, during my mother's generation, uh, interracial marriage was, uh, illegal. And um, I was born in 1967. And it wasn't until 1978 that indigenous people had the right to fully have items like this without 
fear of being arrested or, or worse, drums. 1978, we were allowed the freedom of religion. Um, and so thinking about my mother's generation, when I, uh, when I used to teach at an academic and trade school, um, you know, we had classes of kids. I have uh, students from all around the world and I'm, I'm seeing all these different rich uh, uh, ethnicities and different languages being spoken. And that was not something that you would see uh, until recently, you know, think about the Jim Crow laws and, and, and all the different things that this country has gone through. So um, I always remind my, my young, warriors out, young warriors out there to, to, to uh, be mindful of, of where we are today. And as difficult as it is, uh, think about where we've come from and, and your work is vital. As, as, as that young spirit and that energy that you carry across campuses, at the rallies and all the different things. Um, there is much work to do, but I want you to always be mindful of where, how far we have already come and to keep listening to the elders and keep uh, uh, following, following that path. Um, and so just sharing in a classroom was not something that would happen uh, in the eighties, you know? So this is all something really new and we're all sharing this, uh, cultural and spiritual curve together, right? Some are resistant to it, and we're seeing that now. Uh, talking about Native genocide, talking about Black Lives Matters, it's a trigger for some people. And I think we need to dismantle that and ask why. Why is that a trigger? Why do people get so upset when those topics are brought up? Uh, usually here, like, get over it or things like that, but it's really upsetting to people. Um, and that, that really needs to be further explored. Um, in, my, in my personal understanding of that is because it doesn't, it, it, it changes the story of America. It changes the story that we are exceptional. It changes the story that God, we are God's chosen people. It changes the story that we're always the heroes in the story. Um, and so we, we really need to think about that. Uh, I don't remember how many medals of honor were given out. I think it's about 80 medals of honor were given out to soldiers during the massacre at Wounded Knee and they've never been recalled. And these are the things that we don't, we don't get taught. Um, Abraham Lincoln conducted the, the, the largest mass hanging of anybody. Uh, 38 Dakota men were hung under his watch, under his order. We're not told these things. Um, this doesn't take away the great accomplishments that we've all done together. Um, and, and, I, and I say together, I mean collectively. All the different nations, all the different people, and I kind of laid out a few contributions, just a few that indigenous people have brought to the world. And there are many from all different people. And, but when we think in a, in, a, in a narrative of a master narrative or a white ideological understanding is that you know, everything comes from one place and we have to look to that and kind of in worship. And, and this is where we failed as an understanding in terms of cultural humility and, and equality and not even equality, equity. And so that narrative needs to change because people are understanding and waking up that these stories are harmful, not only to, to, to non-natives and people of color, but to everybody. And these narratives are, are destroying us, us eternally. And we, we all will benefit when these uh, narratives are changed. Um, so, and so with that, um, I think I said enough for now. And I really thank you all uh, for, for listening and, hang, and hanging in there with me on this um, Tuesday night. And so uh, with the time that we have, I'd love to take some questions. Thank you so much, Larry. That was really um, fabulous. I mean, oh, thank you. You really covered so much. I mean, there are a lot of little questions that kind of came up along the way um, for me. I mean, some very, you know, big questions, smaller questions, but just on behalf of everybody, thank you for a really rich, very personal, um, moving, educational at, at many levels. I mean, that was a really wonderful, a wonderful talk. Um, so, one and you know people have asked some questions some of which we've been able to answer uh, like on the chat function already about where your books can be found and um how to help with okuteu that's we've put some of that in, in in the chat right there but i'm wondering um you know it's interesting you just actually talked about that curve um you know of understanding and you know it's 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 obviously daunting of how much you know how 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 recent actually some of the more positive opening ups, uh, you know, of, of the story of the real history, that's how recent that is. But I'm curious um, in particular about the issue and you talked about a lot about reminders and how much of, you know, your, the culture was erased in so many different ways and so many different levels, you know, physically, spiritually, like at all, at all levels. And the, the so sort of the question of memorialization, um, it's an issue where this, I think the country has gotten memorialization wrong in, in so many ways. It's an, an issue that's coming 
to the fore right now with Black Lives Matter and, and monuments being taken down. And I'm wondering about your thoughts about that in ways that how white people and non-natives you know, non can support or establish, whether through memorials or other ways, kind of reminders of the native people, of the importance of their contributions. Um, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts might be about that. Um, the only, I, I think the, thank you for that. That's a great question. Um, uh, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, some of the young allies, accomplices, uh, indigenous people, for, uh, people of color, people of all walks of life essentially to, to carry the words that I've shared in other native scholars and culture keepers and keep the story going. Um, I've been doing talks at different universities uh, uh, to help with some curriculum development for some of these topics. Uh, I think we, we need more of this in the schools. We need uh, more of this education, much like the curriculum I mentioned earlier with the, for the middle school children, Circle Tied to Mother Earth. It's, it's, uh, it's going to take all of us coming together, and it's going to take a national dialogue. Uh, that national dialogue needs to take place. I mean, we have, again, we have an entire country that won't acknowledge the, the atrocities here. So it starts at, on the political level, it starts on the local level, and just keep on moving in this direction. I, and I'm very optimistic because as I said, just thinking back, growing up being bullied and nobody talking about Native people, now it's, it's, it's very prevalent now. And we still have a long ways to go though. That's great. I mean, it's great to hear your optimism. I, I know. <laughs> because yes, it, sometimes I struggle history, with it though, yes. Given your, you know, the experience, so much history, um, it's, that's, that's that's a wonderful thing um, and, and, a, and a vital thing, obviously. You know, one of the questions that just came up relative to this topic was given this 400th anniversary of the Mayflower, how, how, how should the history of the Native Americans be, be communicated and how should they be involved in that? Um. I really, it's kind of a, a shameless plug, but I would encourage everybody to get my book, The Morning Road to Thanksgiving. Okay. If anybody's on the line, uh, on the chat that read that, you can throw in your, um, put in your uh, uh, comments about what you think about the book and so other people can see that, uh, so other people can have some uh, insight from uh, others other than myself. But I think that book really uh, puts together all those thoughts that you just asked that. Um, okay. And uh, okay. again, this really goes into that, again, having that dialogue about that truth, because there's still some narratives, even within Native circles that aren't really, um, that are still coming up to light that still need to be discussed in terms of the uh, history and how it laid out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of people have asked uh, specifically about the chat. I mean, obviously you've outlined a number, but about the challenges facing the Nipmuc people today. Yes, and somebody just asked the name of the book, so I'll say it again. The book is entitled The Morning Road to Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. again, you can go to my website, whisperingbasket.com, and you'll and see And we that. have put the link, FYI, to everybody. The link to Larry's website is, is up there a little further, whisperingbasket.com. So probably that's the best place to go. Sorry, go ahead, Larry. Yep, the challenges Nipmunk people have today, again, uh, by supporting the Nipmunk, uh, the Nipmunk people, the Okitao, uh, the, the traditional uh, people of the tribe um, get to know the Nipmunk people. We're, we're over about 4,000 people in our community now uh, with clans and families. Um, again, our, our, so uh, I didn't get to go into all those slides because of time and when I do that kind of uh, cerebral presentation. Uh, just real quick, the Nipmunk homeland was once 2,000 square miles uh, covering four states, New Hampshire, Northern uh, uh, Rhode Island, uh, and Northern um, Connecticut. And today we're down to mere acres. And so trying to recover our land is, is a big part of that, you know, and the return of our land. And, uh, you know, we've, we have cases with the federal government, state government, and, uh, and we're still under treaty uh, of many treaties going back to the 1700s. And we're really getting, um, hoping the state will begin to honor them. And we do have a somewhat good relationship with certain people in the state. So we hope that we'll keep growing in that traje trajectory. Okay. Um, that's great. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit re related to that, but there have been a couple of questions on the theme of, of how would you point people to, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, support to Okoteu and, and, you know, that we could go to your website, but I mean, potentially people who don't live in, in this particular area of Western Massachusetts, but how can people, um, 
either find out more about their lo local indigenous communities to be to be become involved to become helpful to be become educated how would you direct people oh great right and, and luckily today we have this wonderful thing called the internet and google so <laughs> i encourage everybody out there again um th the most important thing to do is wherever you're calling me from um to support your local tribe because that really puts you in touch with the land and i assure you you're going to find out things about the land and the, and the people that the kind of the things that were probably going on that are that you'll find significant that you didn't know about um because it really helps you have a new relationship and understanding of where you live and and, and begin to understand like here and uh where i live it's, it's so much history right here in that lake with the longest name uh <laughs> that people like to try to say uh, mm -hmm. And so, it's, and it's really has a significant meaning. So reach out, like do some research on the line. If you don't have access to the computer, ask some of the younger ones to, to find out the tribe. And um, and I guess I want to underscore, make sure it's an authentic tribe and organization. Uh, exploitation is real. Uh, uh, it's a real issue that we still face and that's, you know, inappropriation. So that's another whole topic. So make sure you're helping those native people because, um, yeah, there's scammers out there. There's scammers. There's people using that. They'll pull at your heartstrings and send you sad pictures of, you know, the, the the poverty porn pictures. And you know, we don't know where that money goes. So make sure you're working directly with the tribe. Okay, that's great. And again, pointing people. Somebody has just helpfully put up a little link saying, if you don't know the name of your local tribe, there's a great resource, native.land.ca, um, as a place to if you don't know where to start. Maybe that's maybe that's awesome place. Um, and somebody uh, asked an interesting question here. Are you aware of the programs being sponsored by the Episcopal Church, encouraging Americans to face the history and the portrayals we're part of, et cetera, and educating participants through reading videos to acknowledge and come to terms with our history and yours? Are you, is, are you aware of that? Um, if uh, there's, um, there's actually the presidential candidate, the Dene um, Mark Charles, he also re uh, wrote a book recently called, um, on uh, uncomfortable truths um mm -hmm. he's uh he's also a pastor i think if that's the same um um endeavor i think he's a part of that but i did hear some something in that in that respect yes okay okay um here is uh okay a, a question since the narrative of history is so important what are some pieces of native history in this country that you feel people both native and non-native should be more familiar with i mean you've obviously talked you know in, in broad strokes about a lot but may i mean i this this is a, a question i guess is there something in specifically or some specific pieces of the many things you mentioned or others yeah that you yeah. think people should be familiar with yeah they um and i and i could put it as plainly plainly as this people need to know that indians are still here mm -hmm. That's that's a big part of the problem. They don't think uh, there's many people walking around in this country that think Native Americans are gone, and that right there is a significant issue. This is why we can have the the minstrel show like mascots. This is why you don't see a Native person in, in, in the mainstream television shows on sitcoms or in movies very rarely. We're we're kind of like the invisible people here, so we're not seen, so people don't know. That's the first step. Just acknowledging that um, we're still we're still around. And we have viable communities and we have needs and and we're still under treaty i think yeah totally point well taken i mean i think that is so true that is the very first step that i think people are very very unaware of i mean for me seeing the wonderful movie dawn land um was a hugely educational experience actually of 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 of, of both history and things going on with truth and reconciliation commissions etc Right. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned, I'm, I'm curious because there's been a lot of um, debates and arguments and discussions in this area about the issue of mascots, mascots for teams, mascots for schools, et cetera. What, what I would, I think, I would be interested to hear about what you would say about that, what your thoughts are about that. Um, we did a, we actually had a panel on this uh, last week or so. Huh. And um, yeah, so mascots are simply put, they're, they're visual terrorism. Huh. They're, they're visual terrorism because by seeing that, uh, that, that, you know, again, that very, you know, the menstrual show like image or, or these kind of things that where, where your culture and your spirituality becomes the, 
the 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 artifact of entertainment and amusement for 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 others becomes it's a very hurtful thing to have to endure um and so they're they're, they're harmful they're, there's there's a, there's uh evidence based studies that are out now uh people want to look at it, again a, a, a scientific perspective evidence based st studies that people can look up and see the harmful effects of of mascots in in every shape and form mm -hmm. and so um again uh because people think we're not here, we're essentially the last vestiges of safe racism. Um, and so it's, it's like the final conquest. It's like the, you know, the, the, it's like, you know, the final solution to having supremacy over, over a group of people. Now I can control the image that your very image now is like the, 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 the genocide, the oppression, the boarding schools, the assimilation. And now I have your image and now I'm going to do mm -hmm. it as I please. Mm -hmm. And so this is really, it's, it's problematic. Are you on your optimistic theme? I mean, obviously there are there are a lot there are changes. I mean, some are taking have taken an amazingly long time. But are do you feel optimistic about that growing awareness and and changes that are being made? Or yes, I am. And even in my town here, uh, we got together with the superintendent and uh, the different uh, uh, high schools, and we had this horrible mascot removed and. and and the, the staff and, and, and uh, faculty, they agree that need to go. And uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier about how some of this talk is a trigger and because people are still not, um, uh, it, it becomes like a religion, right? Because, and so once you've been heard something for, for so long, it, it challenges your way of thinking and, and uh, uh, your, your story of yourself. And, it, and, it, and it's painful to kind of let go of that story. And we see people holding on to some of these, some of these things. And this is the problem that we're having. Even though they're being told and sometimes shouted at, these are harmful. They hurt people, but they they're they're ignoring that. Um, and so um, I remember I, I was talking to some gentleman, and uh, I kind of had a sarcastic remark because he said, "Well, we had this high school mascot for a hundred years." And I said to him, "I said, well, I'm sure somewhere somebody in 1863 said, well, we had slaves for 300 years. Why do we have to change now?" And so when people start thinking about it in that respect, um, it, it, hopefully they begin to kind of see, you know, that they're essentially trying to have dominion over somebody else's image, somebody else's culture, somebody else's spirituality. And it's problematic. Um, and, uh, and one of the things I mentioned when I was reading my book about native humor, it's, you know, the whole stoic Indian thing. That's very false because Indians, uh, native people, we love to laugh and love to tell jokes. And so, and just maybe if these mascots were part of a joke that we we're all in on, then it probably wouldn't be a big deal, but we're not, you know, and we're, we're being laughed at and people don't, and when somebody sees a real native person, uh, they only have that caricature to go by, that the, 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 the native who is in a perpetual state of violence because he's the warrior, we love his strength, and you know, he's not a scientist, he's not a doctor, he's not an astronomer, he's not, he's not a philosopher, he's not a thinker, he's not a builder, he's just this warrior and he's gonna fight and fight. And so that's all they have. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, that's, that's really, that's very good to hear. Um, there's a, a basic question that I, sh I sh we should have maybe asked before. It was, were the Nipmuc people in the Connecticut River Valley and how much overlap was there with the Pocumtuck people? Oh, yes. Yes. The Pocumtuck and Nipmuc are deeply interrelated. And um, um, so uh, one of the very, um, prominent uh, Nipmuc villages that were shared about uh, in, in historical times was the, the Quaybon. And one of the most uh, prolific leaders of that time was Mudawamp. Uh, Mudawamp, again, when I talked earlier about some of the history, Mudawamp is probably the most, um, uh, uh, he was, he was a, a very powerful force during the King Philip's War of 1675. He was uh, the patent of that time. And, and he, he doesn't get a lot of uh, talk about because I think he was somebody that uh, the English feared even more than King Philip, uh, Metacomet, Massasoit's son. Uh, and so Mudawamp's uh, mother was a Pakumta. And so these two communities, uh, and when we got to think about, and Lisa Brooks gave a great talk about all these interrelations that were there long before, long before colonization that we, we still are beginning to unravel and understand. Uh, but we know that the Pakumtuk and all the river uh, communities were also interrelated with Nipmuc people. Okay. And, and, for that, and for that matter, uh, Massasoit, the, uh, the Poconokan, he spends the rest of his days in, in Quaybog, and at the end of his time, he was identified as a Nipmuc person. And a lot of people don't know that. He's hmm. usually identified as a Wampanoag, but he signed his last treaty in, in 1640s as a, as a Nipmuc chief. 
So this, these are interesting pieces of history that is still becoming, that, that is still rising to the surface. Thank you. Um, we're just about out of time for questions, but here's one. I'm curious about what role you see for local in terms of changing the narrative and education. What role you see for local historical societies, for museums um, in reshaping the narratives here? Getting the tribal people involved, uh, much like uh, Harvard Peabody did, because uh, okay. I used to say uh, how museums are an active crime scene. You know, they really are. Yeah. When you think about the things that they shouldn't have. But um, I know we're getting close uh, the time. So if we can, I can get a few more questions maybe now. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Here's one. How do you manage the conversations that bring up the fact that tribes took slaves of other tribes? And so slave owners are no worse than Native Americans? This is a question. Um, I love that question because um, some people talk about uh, during the Trail of Cheers, the Cherokee had their slaves with them, and it is true. Mm -hmm. um, I, I make no excuse. Slavery is wrong when anybody does it. Mm -hmm. um, and however, uh, not to assuage or mitigate that, it was, it was a, the, so again, we're dealing with language here and the words uh, are not translated in, in equal terms when it comes to indigenous understanding. So when somebody was, a, uh, was enslaved in another tribe, they became part of that tribe. And recently, I think over a decade ago, we saw this case play out in terms of the freedmen in the Cher 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 uh, Cherokee uh, community, mm -hmm. because they were uh, people who were, who were um, eventually uh, brought into the tribe. Um, and that's, that's what uh, the difference between the European style of chattel slavery in terms of indigenous, where you just become one in the tribe. Uh, and it's a very complex thing that, um, so, you know, you wouldn't find a group of, uh, if nipmunks were, a group of nipmunks were captured by, say, Mohawk, you wouldn't find a group of nipmunk toiling in the field and, and, and sleeping out in an outhouse and eating the slop. And they would be right with the same people that they're sharing with. Um, and so it's a very different understanding and it's really not comparable in that sense. Um, okay, I think we are going, I think, um, sadly, we are going to have to pull this to um, a close. Um, and I can't thank you enough. There are, there are more questions, but I, I think it's, it's probably time to wrap it up. So I want to just, um, you know, thank you again, Larry, for a fabulous talk. Um, I also wanted, I'm going to turn it over to you for the, for the final words, but also wanted to just quickly announce that the next talk is on October 21st with Stephanie Morgan Star, Star who's going to be talking about the approach to decolonizing land and liberating minds that she and the New England Farmers of Color Land Trust employs. And she's an herbalist, a soil and seed steward, a scholar and a student and earth worker who grows medicine and food. So that's what you have to look forward to on October 21st. And I'm just going to hand it back to you, Larry, for the final words and to thank you again on behalf of all of us for a great talk. I want to thank the Karuna Center for having me here. This has just been a really um, wonderful time. I want to thank all of you listeners out there for sharing your time with me. And uh, I also want to add importantly that I don't get to see all the chats because I, I was doing a talk somewhere and, and somebody messaged me later on an email that you didn't see my question. You didn't answer it. And, uh, but I just want to make sure everybody knows I don't see all of those. So <laughs> please forgive me if I don't see your question that you're personally asking me. Um, so again, I want to thank everybody uh, for spending your time. And I hope um, you uh, had a good time as I did. And so uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thanks so much. And thanks to you all for who are able to be here with us. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.